Good morning or good afternoon and welcome everyone, wherever you're tuned in from coast to coast to coast today. So it's one o'clock, we will begin. And uh, we are happy to see you again for another Stay Connected presented by Environment and Climate Change Canada's Training and Career Development Division. This webinar is dedicated to MSC Open Data users. My name is Leticia Davignon. I am a meteorologist with the Training and Development Division, and I will be your host for today's session. We are pleased to have Graham Stonebridge from Aquinty with us today. He will present Aquinty's Physics Hydrologic Forecasting Web Services. This presentation will explain how Aquinty, a water resources technology firm, is leveraging MSC's meteorological data services to deliver advanced near real-time hydrologic forecasts based on Aquinty's flagship modeling software, the Hydrogeosphere, in a modern web application. This talk will describe their experiences working with ECCC's data services and showcase their new products. First, let me introduce you to Sandrine Edouard. She's a colleague dealing with envir environmental data processing application at CMC. She's the national coordinator for open data access. She will say a few words to explain the motivation of this webinars and introduce her presenter. Sandrine, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Leticia. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I'm very pleased again to present this uh, webinar in this third series dedicated to MSC Open Data users. Um, for those who join us for the first time, I can see again new names. Uh, it's wonderful. And welcome, everyone. Um, so for your information, MSC Open Data represents uh, 50 million requests per day to MSC Datamart, the uh, HTTPS raw data server, on which you can find about uh, 2.5 terabytes of data daily. Uh, it's also about 8,000 layers and some 10 million requests daily to our API, uh, MSC Geomet, yeah, our geospatial web services. Uh, our users around the world come from various domains of applications from private companies that sometimes depend operationally on our services. As you saw, if you participated in the previous webinars, they also come from government institutions, universities, uh, from uh, agriculture, aeronautics, transportation, hydrology, as we will see today, finance, media, legal and or commercial sectors, or et cetera, et cetera. So welcome to this new webinar series that will once again allow us to better understand who are our users and how they use our data. I'm very pleased today to welcome Graham Stonebridge from Aquanti, a water resources technology firm that develop web applications for the dissemination of advanced hydrologic forecasts based on hydrogeosphere. Graham is a hydrologic modeler, web developer, and data scientist with nine years of work experience. At Aquanti, is building web applications and forecasting systems to disseminate near real time hydrologic prediction based on Aquantis flagship modeling software, Hydrogeosphere. Graham is also conducting a part-time PhD at the University of Waterloo and the, in the Department of Systems Design Engineering. In this presentation, as you said, uh, Leticia, he will explain how Aquanti is leveraging MSC Meteorological Data Services to deliver near real-time forecasts based on Hydrogeosphere in a modern web application. So, Graham, thank you again for your time and for your interest in this uh, webinar. I leave you the floor and I will be happy to meet you again next week for the last webinar, this time dedicated to wheel fire management. So, thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you, Sandrine, and thanks for the kind introduction. I'll just pull up my slides here. Hopefully that's all coming through clear. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Graham, and I've assembled these slides today with the help from a few of my colleagues. Um, Andre Erler is a Quanti senior climate scientist. Steve Fry is a senior scientist at the director level. And finally, I work very closely with Derek Steinmuller, one of our senior software developers. Um, and I know that a number of my coworkers have joined the call today and will be happy to answer some of your questions as a team at the end of the talk. Well, I'm excited to be here today and I'm extremely grateful to have been given this opportunity. I've been emailing Sandrine now with support questions for nearly th three years. And Sandrine, I'm, I'm glad that my team can finally share some of our work with you. My primary 
goal here today is to share some of ex uh, sorry to share some of Aquandi's experiences using the DataMart and GeoMet. To get there, I'll start things off by providing a brief introduction to Aquanti, and then I'll present an overview of our products and services. And that's really going to set the stage to let us dive into a bit more detail to explain how exactly we're using your products. Excellent. Well, let's get started. I'll pr provide a few details about Aquanti. Aquanti is a water resources science and technology firm based in Waterloo, Ontario, and our expertise is in advanced numerical simulations of the terrestrial portion of the water cycle. As of this month, actually the slide's wrong, we have 21 expert staff and we continue to grow. Many of our staff members are inter internationally recognized subject matter experts in the fields of hydrogeology, applied math, climate change, and so forth, and Yes, our, our lofty goal is to help solve some of the world's water problems. Okay, now I mentioned that we focus on the terrestrial component of the water cycle, and when we simulate fluid flow over and beneath the ground surface, we can help inform policy for these various fields. From the sustainable, sustainability perspective on the left, we can think of water as being critical for food generation and public health. And then from a disaster, perspective, we can use, oh sorry, we can use hydrologic modeling to mitigate the impacts from drought, contamination, and flooding. We like to consider water resources from a fully integrated perspective, and to us that means looking at both the surface and the subsurface flows, and then accounting for all the various sources and sinks from industrial and domestic users. Quanti has three main divisions. Starting from the left, we develop and sell hydrologic modeling software. If you're unfamiliar with it, our flagship product, Hydrogeosphere, is a class-leading hydrologic, or sorry, fully integrated hydrologic modeling package, and we sell licenses to academic and industrial groups all across the world. We also do consulting work, and much of that is very specialized and often research-focused. And then finally, on the right, uh, more recently, we've been developing and selling software as a service solutions. So these are web applications that allow us to disseminate hydrologic simulation data to the masses. And these web tools are really the, the primary consumers of your meteorological data. Um, in all, all of our lines of business, we follow this generalized simulation procedure. And I just wanted to include it for everyone's benefit. Um, at the bottom, we start with a, a picture of the real world. Maybe this is an agricultural area with a river flowing through it. And we build a three-dimensional digital model of that area. We can build in all sorts of parameters about the subsurface and surface material properties. We can calibrate those material prop properties to um, historic data. And oftentimes, that's hydrometric data. It can be groundwater observations. It can be soil moisture observations. and that finally brings us to where DataMart comes into play. We use meteorological uh, data sets from reanalysis products to uh, near real-time forecasting products to, to force our hydrogeus for models. Um, primarily, we're using JEPS, but um, you know, we, we use a number of uh, reanalysis products as well. And all of that comes together and we're able to uh, generate simulations on our HPC resources of future conditions. Okay, now we can move on to our products and services. Hydrogeosphere, so, so this is, um, yeah, this is our flagship product. Hydrogeosphere, is, it's a fully integrated hydrologic model. And what that means is we're solving the equations of flow for both the subsurface and the surface domain simultaneously. So on the left we have, or at the top here, we have uh, Richard's equation, so that's for subsurface flow, and we use Darcy's equation to infer the, the flux relationships. And then in the overland flow domain, we have the diffusion wave equation, and we use Manning's equation to infer the flux relationships there. And I'm, I'm only going to show these, these equations like there's you know, we can do so much more. We can do fracture flow. We can do um, contaminant transport and density-dependent flow. But um, for all the work that I'm talking about today, it's it's mainly related to, to these equations. And, and we bring it together in a control volume finite element um, model, model with um, adaptive time stepping. 
Right, so here's like a bench scale demonstration, and hopefully this video shows up for everyone. Um, this is a, yeah, it's only 120 meters long, but it shows what um, water flow might look like in a prairie pothole region. So we have, we're applying precipitation to the surface domain at the top left. It's filling up one of these potholes. Some of the water is spilling over into one of the other potholes, and then it's infiltrating into the ground through a fracture network down towards the water table. And yeah, I mean, this is a challenging environment to model, but uh, we like to show that we're able to model um, some of these more complex processes. So if we zoom out, um, we can simulate some larger scale processes as well. So this is a model of Southern Ontario. And when we build this type of model, which is useful for like a water resources management uh, perspective, we can start with a 3D finite element mesh We'll build in some hydrostratigraphic data. Often that's coming from the geological surveys. Um, we'll build in land cover maps to define our surface friction and evapotranspiration properties. And this type of data is often coming from Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada. And then here's our connection again to Datamart. Uh, this whole model is getting driven by meteorological forcing data. So we're looking at precipitation, snow melt, and potential evapotranspiration. And so this is a distributed model, meaning that we can look at the outputs at anywhere um, in this model that we so choose. We can define observation points for, say, um, stream flow uh, gauging locations. And this is just generally the, the procedure that we follow when we build one of these large water scale or watershed scale models. This is another example that I like to show. It's more of a higher de or more detailed model of the Assiniboine River in Manitoba. On the left, we have uh, some drier conditions, and on the right, we have uh, an aerial photograph of the 2017 flood. And we just um, in this in this figure, we can show how we can simulate the um, the flood extents at pretty high resolution. Um, yeah, for these these types of events. And if this shows up as well, yeah, this is um, the uh, same river, but we're zoomed out to the whole drainage basin. And we can provide a dynamic representation of the standing water depth, depth of groundwater, evapotranspiration rates, infiltration rates, and even soil moisture levels at a pretty high resolution. And uh, in this animation, we were forcing the model with the 30-year reanalysis product. Okay, before I get into the um, web stuff, um, I did want, just want to mention that um, in our consulting business, we do use a lot of meteorological data, primarily um, reanalysis data. So we're looking at things like MARA2 and Air 5 and, of course, CAPA. And, um, yeah, it's in some of our research studies, we've looked at um, the impacts of selecting one product over the other. So if you're interested in that avenue, I've just uh, listed a couple publications here that you can access. Yeah, and and so this brings us to our uh, real-time uh, web, web applications. Um, the first first one that I'm going to demonstrate for you is uh, called Hydrogeosphere Real-Time, or HGSRT. Um, this application takes hydrogeosphere and provides integrated hydrologic modeling to enterprise users as a service. So the idea is that we can build an HGS model of a customer's region of interest and then serve near real-time hydrologic forecasts to the, cons to the consumer in a user-friendly application, um, along with some um, web mapping layers for additional context. And to drive the forecast, we, we, rely, we rely heavily on Datamart, and then for the web mapping um, aspect, we rely heavily on GeoMet. I've taken a few screenshots of the web application to share with you. This is a watershed near Kingston, Ontario. And if you can read the scale bar, we're, we're looking at this at a fundamentally different scale and objective than some of the MSC's hydrologic prediction systems. Um, like this might be a thousand square kilometer um, model domain, um, and we're we're really diving in in pretty high detail. Um, so you can see that we have a number of hydrometric stations here, and if we click on one, 
it will display a hydrograph on the screen. Um, typically, we're doing seven-day probabilistic forecasts based on JEPs. We launch those every day. But in this case, I'm showing you a 32-day JEPs-based forecast um, for this area. And um, so you can see we have some streamflow observations that we're pulling in in black. We have our median um, forecast in red. And then our, um, since, we're, since we are running a probabilistic forecast, we can generate the, uh, the ensemble spread there as well in green. Now, what's, what makes this unique is that we can not only look at the streamflow time series, but we can look at the groundwater time series as well. So here I pulled up a forecast of uh, water levels at a groundwater uh, well. So if we look at the previous figure, we see that, oh, okay, maybe it is starting to get wetter over this um, over this 32-day period. And we can see how that translates into a shift in the water level over that same month-long period. And of course, since HGS is a um, distributed model, we can look at raster format outputs as well. Um, we can show a few of them on the app right now, depth of groundwater and water depth. And I, I've pulled up recharge. And it's interesting to see that it's looking very blue right now. And this might be a sign of our, you know, we're changing seasons where um, things are getting a little wetter and um, there's less evapotranspiration that's happening. So yes, the, the water table is recharging right now, it seems. And um, maybe the exception is along some of those stream beds where we're seeing some um, negative recharge or actual discharge into the streams from the groundwater. And of course, because this is uh, a web mapping application, we can, we can pull in all sorts of um, web map layers. So in this case, I pulled in the 24-hour accumulated precip layer, so that's HRDPA. Um, another popular one is the weather radar precipitation layer. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really limitless what we can pull in from um, your map layer services. So that's excellent. A second application that I'll show to, uh, share with you today is called AgSat. AgSat is a low-cost farm data tool aimed at agricultural producers who are looking for entry-level access to data-driven farming tools. We provide a user-friendly interface to a number of government map layers. Um, some are coming from GeoMet, others are coming from AFC, and even others like geological data is coming from NRCAN as well. And the key value I'd here is that users can purchase high-resolution satellite images of their properties. We look at screenshots. Um, again, you're going to notice that the application looks very similar. It's not a coincidence. Um, you know, we have this sort of core web mapping um, application technology now that we can deploy for different applications. Um, I've just zoomed into the agriculture or the experimental farm in Ottawa, and the key functionality in AgSat is that you can use these drawing tools on the left to sketch out an area of interest. And I've just sketched out one of the fields on the farm. When we click on one of those areas of interest, we can pull up um, this, uh, this menu that shows a whole bunch of data. So at the bottom here, I've plotted the agroclimate indices that are generated by AAFC. And I believe that's using um, DataMart data in the, in the back and to generate these growing degree day maps and um, we can pull up some pre precipitation data. This is a custom data product that we're building out based on HRDPA. So the user can select the base date and we'll generate a time series graph of the cumulative precipitation. So that might be useful if you've gone away for the weekend or for a week and you want to see how much rain your farm got. And then of course, since the main value add is satellite imagery, we have an imagery store. And I've just done a search here for high resolution images that were available for this farm in September. And because it's an urban area, there's quite a bit of imagery that's available to purchase here. Um, I didn't actually purchase any. I, I did order a low resolution image from Sentinel-2 of the normalized difference vegetation index just to show that, uh, yeah, we can, um, you know, this is the core functionality of this application. 
Um, and of course, again, it's a web map, so we can add in all sorts of new layers. Um, for Hagset, we're calculating our own custom layer based on HRDPA. It's this total growing season precipitation. Um, so that's precipitation that's um, accumulated since, I think, May 1st or maybe April 1st. Pulling in HRDPS layers like the volumetric soil moisture content and the soil temperature as well. We're pulling in the American snow dust product, so that gives us an estimate of snow water equivalent. I had to zoom back really far to find snow here. Um, we're pulling in the AAFC's um, annual crop inventory product, and we can see north of Montreal here, there's been a lot of uh, soybeans planted. And finally, the last layer that I'll show you is the AAFC's detailed soil survey map. And yeah, out in Saskatchewan here, you can see this in this particular area, we have a number of different dominant soil types. Okay, well, that's, that's all that I'll show um, in terms of demos for the actual web maps and we can, uh, or web applications. And now we'll look in a little bit more detail at how we use Data Mart and Geomet. Um, we pull in data using Saracenia, and actually, <laughs> um, when I started this application maybe five years ago, we didn't know about Saracenia, and we were writing our own scripts to pull in this data. And there were all sorts of issues that we encountered, um, timeouts, uh, incomplete data downloads. But about two years ago, we switched to Saracenia. It's been absolutely great. It never dies on us. Um, <laughs> and so I just wanted to say kudos to the development team there and for making so much documentation available on GitHub um, for us to access. We do operate a number of pipelines. So JEPS, we, uh, we pull in precipitation, we pull in the snow data, and we calculate snow melt using a growing, or sorry, using a degree day method. Um, and then to calculate potential event evapotranspiration, we're calculating, or we're pulling in data feeds such as uh, the um, radiate, radiative fluxes and um, air temperatures at surface and, and that type of thing. We're also pulling in the daily precipitation analyses. I mentioned that we have a few custom layers uh, based on those. And HRDPS, I think uh, we actually generate our own map layers for that, um, for that product. We actually started the app before GMET was really released to the public. So um, some of those data, um, data layers are actually um, being generated by ourselves. And then finally, for, for the hourly streamflow data, um, we aren't using Saracenia for that. We're just pulling in the raw CSV files right now. And I know that there's a new WFS API for Streamflow data, and we're excited to switch over to that as soon as we can find the time. Just a few more details about the forecasting procedure for your interest. Um, you know, on the left, that's our first connection to Data Mart where we're getting that streamflow data. We're also pulling in um, observations from other sensor networks that are typically managed at the regional level. Um, we have a very crude data simulation uh, routine to come up with their model initial state. And then from the top, we're pulling in, typically we're pulling in JEPS, but I'll elaborate on that in a little bit um, to calculate those forcing fields. And then, of course, we're uploading those results to the cloud for dissemination in our applications. OK, so there's a number of forecast modes that we can run. Um, by far, the most common one that we do is the seven-day probabilistic JEPS forecast. Uh, so we pull in the 1,200 product. Um, and we run 21 HGS for, uh, simulations <clears throat> every day for each of our models. And I think we have any. <clears throat> 20 or 30 models that we're running right now. Um, obviously, this is a coarse product, and for some of our models, the, um, the entire model fits in one grid cell. That's fine. Um, we can also run, using JEPS, we'll run a deterministic forecast for some of our more expensive models. Now, that's using just the, the zero ensemble member that's unperturbed. And I was talking to Sandrine earlier, and she mentioned, oh, well, maybe should you be using GDPS? And actually, I'm not sure. Um, maybe we can talk about that at the end of the talk. <clears throat> I 
And we're also grateful to have the 32-day uh, JEPS forecast as well. We, For a few of our watersheds, we're running that on a weekly basis. Uh, that's the midnight UTC forecast. Excuse me. <clears throat> and, you know, the, the goal there is not really to come up with 32-day um, um, high-quality streamflow predictions. You know, we don't think that we're going to have great predictive skill for streamflow, but for groundwater, um, actually, we think that we'll be able to capture the signal there. Um, since groundwater is more diffuse, it's, um, you know, it, it operates on different timescales. Yeah, and then we, al we also pull in a few American products as well. So there's HER and NAM. Those are both from NOAA, and uh, those allow us on demand, we can launch um, final resolution predictions um, that resolve uh, those convective processes that, you know, JEPS cannot. So a few details about GeoMet now. Uh, yeah, I think you might have seen from uh, those screenshots earlier, we use Leaflet for our uh, web mapping. Uh, it's an open source library, and it meshes really well with um, your OGC compliant map layers in GeoMet. Uh, a few other supporting tools, we use MongoDB to serve some of our geospatial data. We use Vue.js for our uh, for managing our state, and then we also use Redis for um, some middleware caching. Now, okay, so we have had a few challenges with GeoMet. Um, some of the tile layers we found are a bit lower to a bit slower to load. Um, you know, for instance, the precipitation analysis layer um, for the previous 24 hours. Sometimes it seemed like it would take even three or four seconds for the tiles to load, and for us that provides a bit of a degraded user experience for our users. Um, so we have an in-house workaround. We, we use a proxy with middleware caching, and we just reserve that data ourselves. Um, so we can we can prefetch it, or if someone else has accessed it, it, it adds to the cache, and then we can serve it from our own servers, just for the a few specific layers that we really care about. OK, so we, we have um, a few typical questions that we get asked by our users. Um, particularly on the farming application AgSat. Um, people are asking about archived weather radar data, right? So they might go away for a while, uh, come back to their farm, and, and want to know when the thunderstorm came through. Um, I realize that that's a really big ask, um, <laughs> and so I'm not asking for it, um, but um, it is something that we get asked about all the time. Um, and on a similar vein, people are asking if um, we can tell whether it hailed on their farm. And, you know, that's a really challenging um, thing to do. Um, maybe the science isn't quite there yet, and maybe a few years down the road we'll have something to share there. Um, and then I also mentioned that we're showing a few of those HRDPS layers and things like soil moisture. Um, when someone zooms in all the way into their farm and they, they look at a soil moisture value, it's kind of hard to understand what, like, what's 0.3 meters cube per meter cube mean. And um, I guess for us, that means we should really be focusing on um, converting those those fields from numerical fields to, um, you know, uh, this is a drought, this is a, a flood event to different types of maps. Yeah, and, and that that's all that I wanted to share today. So um, just to summarize, Aquanti has developed some um, advanced integrated hydrologic modeling capabilities um, with our core software Hydrogeosphere. Uh, more recently, we built this hydrologic forecasting system that leverages DataMart. And yeah, we're build, we're starting to build these um, responsive value-added web applications that leverage the GeoMet APIs. And none of that web stuff really would be possible at all without the excellent um, data services and from my perspective as a developer, also the, the GitHub websites that document it all, um, that's fantastic. And so we hugely appreciate all of your open data initiatives. And again, as a research firm, we are always open to collaboration. And that, that wraps up my talk. So th thanks very much for your time today. I'll pass it back to you, Sandrine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Graham, for this wonderful presentation. It was quite interesting to learn a bit more on the hydrogeosphere model. 
um, to see the various web applications that you have developed and uh, how the MSC data marts uh, come into play for your forecasting procedures. Um, so we are uh, at, uh, ready for the questions per question period. So if you have any question, please raise your hand or you can type them into the chat. Let's start with you, André. Yes, uh, excellent presentation. Uh, really uh, uh, fabulous, all, all the data that you uh, you take and all that you do with it. Um, I have a question regarding uh, when when you do forecast, do you, do you do water level forecast and how does that uh, uh, or do you fold a few feathers on, on, on from some uh, provincial level governments, for example, who are uh, the, the ones who are uh, entitled for for a water level forecast? Is, is this is, is this an issue? Um, sorry, just just to try to re remember what you asked. Um, you're asking how we do groundwater level forecasts, and um, to answer that, um, like hydrogeosphere is fully integrated, so when we uh, run our models. It's simulating not just surface flow, but also subsurface flow. Um, mm -hmm. pr probably, and yeah, and so we're able to generate um, water level forecasts at any of our model nodes. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and, and probably um, the biggest challenge we have is just with um, biases between the actual um, station data that we can pull in from these provincial organizations and mm -hmm. um, from our own model outputs. So it's something that we're looking at right now and trying to, to clean up. Okay. And uh, I was curious about your usage of, uh, of the JEPS uh, control uh, 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 control uh, model. Yeah. Uh, and that's going, are they using both the, 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 the JEPS control, mo uh, the control run and, and the GDPS? Uh, would be interesting. And also, <clears throat> Using the RDPS along with the uh, with the NAM, uh, I think <clears throat> the RDPS is out to 84 hours, and you, you may benefit. I'm not sure if the NAM is now at a higher resolution than the than the the, the reps the, the RDPS, which is at 10 kilometer. But it would be, <clears throat> sorry, it would be interesting for you to compare both. I, I think you're right, and that would be a very interesting uh, inter comparison study to, to look yeah, at basically NAM. the implications of choosing one product versus the other. Did you have some input, Andre? Yeah, NAM is probably uh, more comparable to HRDPS than RDPS in terms of resolution. I, I think it's at three kilometers now. Oh, okay. <clears throat> okay, good. Great, thank you. Uh, let's yeah. go with you, Vincent. Uh, hi, Perry, and this is again on this station. Uh, I was hoping yeah, for your hydrological forecasting system, who are the clients? <laughs> so um, I, can't, I can't describe or I can't list all of our clients today, um, but I can tell you that a number of them are, um, so for instance, conservation authorities in Ontario. Okay. Um, we're looking at even just uh, research collaborations with um, a number of government organizations. Um, so, for instance, MECP, um, based in Ontario, and um, we're also looking at um, a number of um, like enterprise groups um, in the energy mining industry that I can't really talk about. Okay, so you do have, but I was wondering if you have links with the conservation authorities in particular. Yeah, and, and a lot of those organizations are doing their own, um, at least the larger CAs are doing their own um, flood prediction, but um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so you uh, in this case you provide the information to the conservation authority. They might integrate it with their own forecast and provide some value added product. Yeah, to, to provide uh, an example, um, one of our conservation authority users will take our streamflow forecasts and use those to drive their high resolution HECRAS models. Okay, so they'll use that boundary conditions. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's interesting. So uh, as you probably know, uh, Environment Canada also is issuing a hydrological forecast for, for these same watersheds in the area. So that's right, yeah. Yeah, and we're excited to see that roll out. Uh, this data will likely not be available directly to you, but it will be available to the conservation authorities. So. 
and since you're working with them, work something out. Yeah. But uh, as far as we're aware, y your modeling is not uh, integrated ground water modeling, right? We don't do ground water well. We have a simple bucket model for ground water. It's really for yeah. a stream flow and a near surface soil moisture. Yeah. Do do you so you you do include the the land surface component with the soil moisture, right? Like a ISPA uh, model or something like that? It's SDS. Uh, the land surface model is SDS, so it's been compared in the past to like atmosphere. And do that, uh, but it's still just uh, uh, I think seven layers of soil over uh, a few meters, so it's not as detailed. Uh, but it does a job for uh, just making the uh, uh, interflow in this and, and service runoff. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Vincent. Uh, let's go with you, Etienne. Yes, uh, well, thank you for the presentation. Very interesting system. I was just wondering over which areas uh, is the streamflow forecasting system currently uh, implemented? Yeah, okay, so I can answer that. Um, we built a, a model of southern Ontario with, in a collaboration with the Ontario Geological Survey a couple of years ago. And um, so we've ro rolled it out for all of southern Ontario right now. Um, and we're starting to uh, roll it out for other areas as well. The, the challenge is building the, the models um, and finding the funds to do that. But um, for any sort of previous uh, model that we've ever built um, for other clients in other areas, we can roll those out. Thank you. Um, Dorothy, your, yes, your turn. Hi. So um, I was wondering, you calculate precipitation plus snow melt. So I'm guessing you're estimating surface runoff. Did you know that Datamart provides surface runoff from jets? Oh, um, did we know that? <laughs> um, well, so, that? okay, yeah. Um, so I, I would expect that uh, JAPS does produce uh, surface runoff as well. Um, uh, so, but surface runoff um, is a uh, quantity that's produced by the land model. So, um, there is um, evaporation may have already occurred to some extent. There's canopy interception. Um, so, these are all processes that we also simulate in our model. Um, so, this is why we use the snow melt and uh, precip. Um, so, it's a bit of a hybrid approach. Um, we don't currently simulate snow, although we are working on that, but we simulate a lot of the other land surface processes. Um, so that, that's the reason for this. Okay, thanks. Uh, in the chat, there is a comment from Alex. It says that in terms of performance, the RDPS typically outperforms the NAM for almost every forecast range ob objectively for mass fields. Subjectively, it's the same even, even for QPF. Okay. Well, maybe we need to uh, build an RDPS. We have most of the, the scripts set up for based on JEPS. So, um. and question: Is this the um, the HRDPS or the just the RDPS? Alex, would you would you like yeah. to uh, add? The RDPS. Yeah, yeah, so the RDPS. I don't think the HRDPS goes up to sixty hours. Yeah, no, it doesn't. I, but I, okay, I, I thought the RDPS also only does forty eight hours. It's available up to 80 hours. Oh, really? Okay. And at 10 kilometer, you said? Yes. That is. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else have a question? It's in your. <laughs> yes. You can go uh, ahead. Yeah. Me again, so um, since you're uh, modeling the area of southern Ontario, I was wondering how do you deal with tide drains in these agricultural areas? Do you explicitly uh, simulate them in, in the model? So we, we do both. Um, we can really only do tile drain um, explicit representation at a, a really small scale. Um, we, we have a, a site with AAFC where we're um, explicitly representing those. And for uh, the rest of those areas we're using um, modified material properties to effectively represent um, the drains. 
And uh, could you suggest any scientific publication on, on that? Or? I, uh, or, I don't or think I just... off the top of my head, sorry. <laughs> okay. Or some documentation of the, of the model, maybe? I will, um, you know, maybe I'll go back to my team here and see if I can uh, and, and find a, a good reference to share with you, because I'd be curious to, uh, to think about that a little bit more. Thanks. There, there certainly are references if you can find them, um, but I also don't know them off the top of my head. Yeah, if you want to share that with that, uh, with us uh, later, uh, uh, Graham, we will uh, we will uh, make sure that uh, the information goes back to Etienne. Okay. Yeah, and and you have my email address if you want to share it. That's fine too. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Vincent. Say one more question. I was wondering if uh, you've made use in the past or of the uh, Pasper archive for accessing past forecasts at the University of Waterloo. Yeah, um, we're aware of it, and and I have tried using it. Um, so, yeah, it's it's great that that exists. Um, I found that when we um, try to write our scripts that process the the data from DataMart. Um, you know, we write it for DataMart, but then the format that we get out of Casper is different. Um, so we've really only focused on DataMart, to be honest. Okay, that's, that's good. Yeah, thanks. Oh, and thanks for the links, Andrew. And last question. Uh, uh, are you aware of the recently uh, released uh, reanalysis based on Jen? Oh, um, not personally. Um, uh, yeah, I've heard that there is one, but uh, I don't know anything about it. Um, so, um, if you could <laughs> yeah, share I'll some, the paper. yeah. The data is on Casper, and the paper is in uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, I believe I, I believe I've seen it on Casper um, when I recently looked. Um, you might find this useful. Yeah. But as Graham said, the the issue with Casper is mainly that um, it it serves like one thing is based on shape files, and then the other thing is um, it serves uh, NetCDF. Uh, so it's it's very different from the way that DataMart serves data, and so you basically have to like redo all your scripting. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's great that a forecast archive exists, um, and uh, so like. Graham mentioned biases, and, and um, the, we, we we are looking forward to being able to actually um, do bias correction based on a decent historical record. Um, but it's just a lot of extra work because the format is different. It would be easier if it was just the same format as data mart. Yeah, that's valuable feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. Anyone else before we wrap it up? Well, thank you all for your participation and your questions. Um, so this presentation was recorded and it will be posted on our training portal on the Vimeo and on the Vimeo platform um, probably later this week. As for the PowerPoint presentation, um, it was translated into French. So both versions will be available on the training portal only. So on behalf of TCDD, I thank you all for your participation and a big thank you to you, Graham, and your team for giving us the chance to learn more about how Aquinty uses the MSC's data. It is very much appreciated. I wish you all a great day and I hope to see you all next week. Bye, everyone.